Bien, te pasó para eso. Мне это рад еще как я еще. Ой, я. Ой, даже не вспоминай. Вспоминаю на самом деле. Не Кристиана есть. Да. Кстати, спасибо, что на фон оставили я, да? is the sound of uh, the so-called Lydian dominant skill. This can be an intriguing, glorious story and even haunting sound which is excellent to compose all kinds of pretty colorful music. Now in this video we're going to look at some theoretical, practical and some applicable aspects of this particular skill. First we're going to look at the basics of the skill and after that we're going to explore the names the skill goes by. Uh, next we're going to uh, we're going to harmonize the skill and uh, look at ways to study it and to get familiar with it. Now, then you'll see in what situations you can use this Lydian dominant skill. And we look at some arpeggios that are useful in this context. And finally, we create a pentatonic version of the skill, which can be uh, helpful to start off with. Now, during the tutorial, you'll be able to learn some useful licks and riffs. So, let's not waste any time and let's go for it. So what is this Lydian dominant skill? Well, it can be described in many ways. And the simplest way to look at it is to approach the Lydian dominant skill as a major skill with a raised fourth degree and a flattened seventh. This is a major skill with 
the rest fourth degree in the flat on seven. This is the most straightforward, but certainly not the best. A more sophisticated way is to see it as the scale of which it comes from, namely the melodic minor scale. And to be exact, the Lydian dominant scale is the fourth note of a melodic minor scale. So for instance, the A Lydian dominant scale is extracted from the E melodic minor scale, because A is the fourth note in the E melodic minor scale. But there are more ways to approach this beautiful skill, and that's all in the name. The name of the scale Lydian dominant betrays the hybrid character. On one hand, it's the Lydian scale, and on the other hand, it's the dominant scale. So it's a real mixture of both scales creating a brand new sound. The G, uh, in G major, the Lydian note starts on the fourth note, uh, in this case, the note C. So C Lydian looks and sounds like this. dominant scale. The dominant character lies in the flattened seventh degree and a major third, which also defines the mixolydian mode. Now this is the fifth mode of a major scale, so C mixolydian is the fifth mode of an F major scale and looks and sounds like this. Now combining the characteristic note of the Lydian scale with the correct characteristic note of the mixed Lydian scale, or dominant scale if you like, will create a hybrid Lydian dominant scale. A mixed Lydian scale with a sharp and fourth degree or a Lydian uh, scale with a flattened seven degrees. The same thing. Uh, so the C Lydian dominant scale looks and sounds like this. Now, because of its ambiguous character, the scale goes by many names. And the most popular name is addressing it by the most obvious name, and that's the Lydian flat 7 or the Lydian dominant scale. But as we've seen uh, just now, the scale can also be seen as a Mixolydian sharp 4 scale. Mixolydian scale with a raised 4th degree. And the third interesting name is the acoustic scale or overtone scale referring to the resemblance of the harmonic partials on, for instance, the note C. Now, overtones are uh, notes that, uh, that sound along with the note that is actually played and gives acoustic instruments like the guitar and piano its timbre and its characteristic sound. Now, overtones that sound when we play the note C uh, are C1, C2, G2, C3, E3, G3, B flat 3, C4, E4, F sharp 4, G4, A4, and so on, resulting in this cumulative sound. Some of the overtones are not in tune, but that's common for overtones. And all the notes of the Lydian dominant scale are re represented more or less in those partials. Now we can grasp this overtone mix in a 13 arpeggio that contains all the notes of the Lydian dominant scale. And this results in a dominant 9, 13 sharp 11 arpeggio. So let's harmonize the dominant Lydian scale and let's do this on the tonic A so we can use the open A string. Uh, later on, uh, as our drum tone to establish a strong tonality towards the tonic A. Uh, the notes of the A Lydian dominant scale are A, B, C sharp, D sharp, E, F sharp, and G. Now, the sharpened fourth degree D sharp and the flattened seventh degree G are the characteristic notes in this major scale. Uh, the chords that emerge from this scale when we harmonize it by stacking third intervals are as follows. The A dominant 7 chord, the B dominant 7 chord, the C sharp minor 7 flat 5 chord, the D sharp minor 7 flat 5 chord, the E minor major 7 chord, the F sharp minor 7 chord, and the G major 7 and sharp 5 chord. Of course, these chords are the ones that you'll find in the E melodic minor scale, of which A Lydian dominant is extracted. Remember that the Lydian dominant scale starts on the fourth note of a melodic minor scale. Now, the chord uh, that contains the two characteristic notes uh, is the chord in the fifth degree. 
beautiful and mysterious minor major seven chord. Uh, this contains the notes E, G, B and D sharp. We all know this chord from the James Bond theme, first used in Dr. No in 1962. Hello, it's Natalia Vadyanova. See how quickly you managed to bring a call. What's up, guys? It automatically changes the video calls and the ecosystem of Galaxy. Today I'm going to talk about the details. G major 7 sharp 5 chord, uh, also a chord with lots of character and also containing the characteristic notes. It's also a beautiful chord to use. So using these two chords, the E minor major 7 chord and the G major 7 sharp 5 chord played over an A drum would trigger the A Lydian dominant sound. Now we could come up with this uh, straightforward trigger the A Lydian dominant sound. <coughs> within this skill. Многие говорят о том, что будущий средний класс это люди, которые рассказывают о том, что они любят, 
Может быть на небольшую аудиторию, но при этом есть очень много способов монетизации, и люди эти способны поддерживать свою семью и свой доход за счет того, что создают такой контент. Приходите на мой бесплатный марафон, мы с вами там разберем, что такое экономика креативности, как сейчас создавать контент, и главное, как монетизироваться, если вы не собираетесь становиться блогером-миллионником, если вам не нужно 500 или 600 тысяч подписчиков, а вы хотите там на небольшую аудиторию вещать, но при этом делать это основным источником дохода или хотя бы второстепенным, но ощутимым. Приходите на мой марафон, жмите на синюю кнопку, с вами подробно поговорим про экономику креативности. skill patterns of the Lydian dominant skill. Now become the affordable smartphone market has exploded and one company leading the charge is Xiaomi or more specifically two of Xiaomi's sub-brands that's Poco and Redmi. I'm Cam Bunton from Pocket Lens and I have two of the most affordable phones right here the Poco F3 and the Redmi Note 10 Pro. The Poco costs more than the Redmi, so which should you buy? Hopefully in this video I'll help you decide. And while you're here, if you could hit that like button, tap subscribe and the notification bell, that would be wonderful. So what's the same? With these two phones being part of the same company, there are plenty of similarities. Both run UE12, Xiaomi's Android skin, built on top of Android 11, and for the most part, they're the same. There are subtle differences in software, but for the most part, they look, feel, and act like each other. The one difference I did notice is that Poco doesn't seem to have the option for navigation gestures. After so long not using the old school <coughs> Android buttons, it's weird being navigation gesture. The one difference I did notice is that Poco doesn't seem to have the option for navigation gestures. After so long not using the old school Android buttons, it's weird being forced to do so. If I'm wrong and they are hidden somewhere that I haven't managed to find yet, please do let me know in the comments. Now in design, most important features are the same. Put them side by side or hold them both and you'll struggle to notice any major differences, but they do exist. So while they're built on the same frame and are largely the same size and weight, give or take a few millimeters and grams, there are subtle indicators that they're not exactly the same. For instance, the cheaper Redmi phone has a 3.5mm port in the top edge, but the Poco doesn't have one. And while the camera lens arrangement is almost the same, the design, but the Poco doesn't have one. And while the camera lens arrangement is almost the same, the design of the housing is square on the Redmi. And while the camera lens arrangement is almost the same, the design of the housing is square on the Redmi. And round on the Poco. Placement of the SIM tray is different too. The F3 has the tray built into the bottom edge, while the Redmi has it in the top of the left edge. But more crucially, it also features a slot for a micro SD card, so you can expand the storage, as well as being dual SIM compatible. Both feature glass back and expand edge. But more crucially, it also features a bottom edge, while the Redmi has it in the top of the left edge. But more crucially, it also features a slot for a micro SD card, so you can expand the storage as well as being dual SIM compatible. Both feature glass backs and plastic frames and even have identical fingerprint sensors built into the slim power wake button on the right edge, just below the volume rocker. The fingerprint sensor is really responsive and has unlocked the phone quickly and efficiently the entire time I've been testing them. Sometimes you can accidentally touch it though. Do that enough times with the wrong finger or the wrong part of your finger and you'll make it think you failed to register properly. That forces you then to use a PIN or a password to log in instead. Now the first hint that the Poco is a more premium phone comes when you start typing on the keyboard. With the vibration feedback on, you'll feel a much more subtle and precise haptic response from the F3, while the Note 10 Pro has a more standard vibrator motor buzzing underneath your fingers. Now, switching to displays, and again, you might struggle to see much difference. Both have the same size and resolution. It's an AMOLED Full HD Plus panel boasting up to 120Hz refresh rates. When it comes to sharpness and brightness, there's nothing to separate them. Not really. Where we saw the biggest difference was in contrast and color performance. The Redmi was warmer by default and seemed to have a bit too much contrast. The Poco screen showed things in a way that was a lot more subtle and natural. Redmi was a little harsh by comparison with its crushed blacks, often meaning you lose detail on darker colors and in the shadows. 
and in the highlights too. So, spec fans, it's here in the battery and the performance, but you're going to be paying most of your attention, probably. Poco F3 has the more powerful Snapdragon 870 processor, plus UFS 3.1 storage for fast processing and read-write speeds. The Redmi is no slouch though and has a Snapdragon 732G processor and slightly slower solid-state storage. Numbers on a page are one thing, but real daily performance is another. And that's what really matters, and it's definitely one area you can tell the difference. Unsurprisingly, the almost flagship processor in the Poco phone results in a snappier and more responsive feeling phone. In the general interface they both feel pretty much the same, but once you start loading things like games or the camera interface, the Redmi lags behind slightly. Switching between shooting modes in the camera takes a bit longer on the Redmi, just as an example. It's not terrible, but if your priority is speed and fluidity, it doesn't deliver in quite the same way. Where it does deliver in bucket loads, however, is in battery life. Its larger capacity battery and the software's aggressive battery management mean it's not too difficult to get two days from the Note 10 Pro, even with a couple of hours gaming thrown in every day. Two the same way. All but even the capsule in the general processor in the Poco phone results in a snappier and more responsive feeling phone. In the general interface they both feel pretty much the same, but once you start loading things like games or the camera interface, the Redmi lags behind slightly. Switching between shooting modes in the camera takes a bit longer on the Redmi, just as an example. It's not terrible, but if your priority is speed and fluidity, it doesn't deliver in quite the same way. Where it does deliver in bucket loads, however, is in battery life. Its larger capacity battery and the software's aggressive battery management mean it's not too difficult to get two days from the Note 10 Pro, even with a couple of hours gaming thrown in every day. Still, neither has bad battery life. The F3 will comfortably get through even the busiest of days and make it partway through a second. So again, on cameras there are similarities, but they're not identical. Both phones have a primary ultrawide and macro sensor. The Note 10 Pro also has a low-res depth sensor. Where the biggest difference comes in though is with the primary camera. The Poco has a 48 megapixel sensor, where the Redmi has a 100 with the Pro also has a low-res depth sensor. Where the biggest difference comes in though is with the primary camera. The Poco has a 48 megapixel sensor, where the Redmi has a 108 megapixel sensor, which is slightly larger. Of course, both phones pixel bin down to lower resolutions when you're shooting in automatic mode. Now, you might think the bigger sensor would produce the better images, but that's actually not the case. On the surface, they're quite similar, at least when you compare colors. Where we noticed the major difference was in the quality of the detail. The Poco F3's photos just seem sharper and more realistic most of the time. That carries through to when you enable 2x digital zoom as well. Ultra-wide performance was similar on both, but the two struggle with blur at times and often produce images that look suboptimal, putting it kindly. Now, overall, in truth, both of these phones really do punch above their weight when you consider how much each of them costs. The Redmi Note 10 Pro is an absolute bargain for £249 in the UK, and the F3 gives you a close to flagship level performance in a phone that costs just over £300. If you decide to spend the extra on the F3, you won't regret it. The F3 is snappier, smoother and more responsive, has a better primary camera and better display performance. However, if you care more about long battery life and having practical things like a headphone port and expandable storage, you can't go far wrong with the Note 10 Pro. It's a stunning budget phone. I've been Cam, I'm at Cam Button on social media. You can find me and follow me there, ask me any questions you want, or you can use the comments down below. Hit like if you like this video, and subscribe and tap the notification bell to make sure you don't miss any more. And I'll see you again in the next one. British, British. Ah, it's still here, David. Big, big, big. Ryzen. Ryzen. Jason Sincere, and uh, I'm going to do a talking head video today, so feel free to minimize it, put out your favorite music or whatever, and uh, just, have, uh, just listen, because with all the rumors swirling around about AMD's new platform coming out, new socket, with that potentially new DDR5 memory, I wanted to kind of talk to those that are on the fence about Ryzen because trust me, I was in that same exact boat as you guys where I was just like, you know what? There's no way AMD could ever fight back and top Intel when it comes to being topped up. 
That was then, this is now. So we're going to tell you about what our experience has been like considering both Phil, Nick, and I have AMD rigs here at the studio. And uh, Phil and I have been using AMD exclusively now for the last several years. Today's video is sponsored by iFixit. And iFixit's Father's Day... Today's video is sponsored by iFixit and their iFixit Father's Day promotion. And they figured the best way to show my love for Father's Day is to torture her with some Father's Day jokes. Are you ready? How does Darth Vader take his toast? No. On the dark side. Did you know the circle is the most ridiculous shape in the world? There's absolutely no point to it. I was going to tell you a dad joke about construction, but I'm still working on it. What do you get if you put ducks in a cement mixer? You get quacks in the pavement. So this Father's Day, give your father figure the best gift ever by heading to the link in the description below where you can save $10 off any order, $50 or more, by using my link and offer code DADS2021. What do you, what do you think? You like my, you like my jokes? All right. You like my, you like my jokes? And offer code DADS2021. What do you, what do you think? You like, my, you like my jokes? All right, so without wasting a lot of you guys' time going into like a history lesson on Ryzen, we've, we've talked about it in the past. We've covered, obviously, first-gen Ryzen, which was like 1800X and 1700X and all that. We talked about the 1.5 Ryzen, which was the 2000 series and the 3000 series. Ross. The battery. <laughs> Мама хорошая тема. Ну, я тоже так считаю. Должна быть семья, это же пожаление отца. See, now fast forward uh, five years into... Ryzen 
да, да, да. То есть что тебе надо сказать? Да, ты понял, да, отвлекал бы ты раз, ты понял. Да, да. Ну, ну, series and with the newest generation coming out I believe rumored later this year I have no information on that but I'm borrowed or anything I don't know so I'm just telling you what I think the uh, all the signs are pointing to I think it's important to talk about where we've come from in terms of kind of weirdness that we used to experience because I could never talk about Ryzen without being like Ryzen's great but it's kind of weird we have weird issues and, and I want to talk about that because that is what I think puts off a lot of people so when we first started using Ryzen, I did a video, and this is actually before Phil even started working here, I did a video where I always had my Intel X299 platforms, this X99, then X299, and Intel, because at the time, Intel had the highest core counts, in fact, Intel had the only real competition in town, because Zen wasn't out yet, and they hadn't touched their platform since uh, uh, Bulldozer and Excavator and all that, which is the FX series, so it was like, I think Power Driver was the last one, but... It, uh, it just was terrible. It, it was a 2011 architecture. It was bad. It was not efficient. It were like shared cache between cores and it was just terrible, absolutely terrible. And so Intel was the only game in town. If you wanted high core counts and you had to go like X299 and all that. I did a 30 day, here's how Ryzen went using it for only 30 days. Now back in the 1800X was the CPU that was that was the top of the line at the time, not counting County Threadripper. I, had issues with Twitter and that, we talked about that in the past already. So I've been using AMD exclusively now here in the studio for about the last three years. And Phil has been using Threadripper exclusively for the last, what, about two years maybe? Year and a half, two years at least. Now Phil has a perspective obviously from the production side of things, editing videos, how Ryzen and Premiere specifically kind of interact, um, obviously gaming as well. I, on the other hand, use my system because it's not the one we rely on to make videos to test out different hardware. So I've, I've been on Threadripper, I've been on standard Ryzen, I've been on the different cores within Ryzen, water-cooled, air-cooled, all of it. And so I can tell you right now, the weird issues that we always experienced with Ryzen were USB drop-offs. I mean, the simple one. And the nice thing is that the chipset manufacturers and chipset BIOS writers and such and driver writers for AMD motherboards, whether it be Gigabyte, you know, ASUS, MSI, ASRock, in the beginning, rollouts were kind of slow, seeing any sort of fixes. And it seemed like, well, it's not seemed like, it was the fact that companies initially weren't putting a lot of R&D into AMD products, although it was a new platform, because it wasn't proven yet. And by proven, I mean it wasn't proven that people were going to adopt it and build on it right away. As in, uh, AMD started getting back market share, and having more Ryzen processors in the field, they started putting way more effort into BIOS updates, which I feel like BIOS updates for AMD boards are rolling out constantly. Some might look at that and be like, well, that's because they're constantly having problems. No, they're constantly tweaking things. They're constantly getting better memory support. They're constantly getting better driver support in the chipsets and USB drivers and, and M.2 controllers and all that sort of stuff. So it's like everything has just been improving. So the USB dropout issue was something we were experiencing in the beginning, even on uh, as late as like 3000 series processors, where we'd be out here filming and then we would hear someone's system inside the editing den disconnect a USB device. So we would just randomly hear doo 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 and be like, whose PC was that? I don't know. And we would go in there and investigate whose mouse isn't working, whose keyboard isn't working, or whose, you know, whatever. And we never found anything wasn't working. So it's almost like it would drop off and never make a reconnect sound, probably because it happened so quickly. Um, it was just sort of annoying, it, it's to say the least. The other issue that I experienced uh, more regular was stability issues with RAM. RAM in the beginning was a sore spot for Ryzen because the way the CPU works with its infinity fabric and the way the chiplets connect on the substrate through the infinity
работать надо. То есть, как, когда тебе все легко, это как бы, ну да, понимаешь, стасяк, да, ворота, когда... То есть без труда, значит, без труда, значит, да, 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 это, да, это, это значит, скоро закончится все. Значит, да, да, значит, это чуть-чуть еще, скорее всего. Да. Ты трудился, никто не слушал, что ты был мужиком, понимаешь, да? И тоже всех, да, ты мама от тебя хочет этого, и папа там, и все, да.
Нормальной играй, нормальной.
Кушайте мне, коллеги. Кушайте. Кушайте, кушайте. Или там кушайте.
стараешься заделяешься заделяешься
Внимание! Приготовьте путешествовать дешево. Для этого Озон Travel на Озон. И заказы командировку и чайте 5% процентов как поездок с Озон. The Samsung Yelixma Ultra starts $200. We have a phone that starts at far actually less than half the price. Snapdragon 5G 12 gigabyte under 44 hertz. I go to my store, her 5G 12 gigabyte 144 hertz. Screen refresh rate. So if I go, you can see under display, I can pick between various refresh rates all the way from 60 to.
to 144. That is crazy for five dollars. And also the phone has a special gaming space mode. So when I click on it, it actually transforms the phone into a mini console with a whole bunch of crazy options we're gonna look at. Now if you already have an S21 Ultra, obviously you're not gonna sell that and buy this one, but if you're in the market, you got to check this one. It is a highly attractive option. Let's dive in. the phone and see what we get so this here is the Nubia Red Magic 6R and just so you know the R stands for racing let's see what we get in the box all right so once we lift up the cover that's what we get inside so here's a little box let me pull this up put it to the side for a second there's the phone it does have an in display fingerprint move this for a minute take that off right let's see what black charger is in the box okay and I do want to let you know here actually is a 30 watt fast charge so it is not a slow charging and then what we have is we have a red that's for charging the phone connects to the charger then it goes home and the phone charges let's put these over here we have a usb to 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and everything you get in the uh, divert our attention quad camera system camera is going to be a 64 megapixel camera of recording at 8k then you have an ultra wide camera 8 megapixels and then we have a 5 camera and finally a type c port over here there's nothing on this side as you can see uh, over here Выбирай электроинструменты Black Decker на Wildpix. Уже более 100 лет Black Decker разрабатывает электроинструменты для дома и ремонта, популярные во всем мире. Успей купить хиты легендарного бренда со скидками до 40% на Wildpix. Вот так вот она выглядит. Здравствуйте, дамы и господа, с вами Энте Шнапс. Как известно, ГСК Game World недавно анонсировали, что Stalker 2 разрабатывается на движке Unreal Engine 5. Движок Unreal Engine имеет под собой большое количество разнообразных и очень интересных технологий. В данном видео я, в свою очередь, покажу вам и расскажу про эти технологии на примере Stalker. Покажу, как они будут выглядеть в движке Unreal Engine 5 на примере сталкерских ассетов из оригинальных игры что примерно вообще стоит ожидать и когда нужно будет вырезать почки не только у себя а также у своих родных чтобы купить компьютер для stalker 2 ну и как мы знаем у gsk game world очень странная пиар компания возможно там проблемы с продюсированием зато школа xyz научит тебя самому продюсированию игр покажет как нужно продвигать игру от идеи до дальнейшей реализации в магазине научит тебя как э, внедрять какие-то механики делать обновления для игры выстраивать четкий пайплайн чтобы ваша студия ваша команда работала как часики создавать правильный пиар э, перед инвесторами перед издателями научат правильной монетизации чтобы пользователи не плевались от этого а именно хотели вкладывать свои деньги в игру курс ведет опытный преподаватель у которого более 10 игр за плечами если сейчас к примеру только с деньгами то курс можно приобрести в рассрочку на 12 месяцев и инвестировать, так сказать, все это в свое будущее. Это не кредит, проценты платить не надо. Также есть акция, благодаря которой ты можешь приобрести любой курс со скидкой 20%. Это все суммируется с промокодом. Кстати, если вы введете мой промокод, то вы получите также дополнительно скидку в 10%. Ссылки будут в описании и в закрепленном комменте. Переходите по ссылке в описании и в закрепленном комменте и создайте свою игру мечты. 
Итак, для начала давайте небольшой экскурс в то, как я все это воссоздал. Переходим на сайт P3DM, заходим в раздел «Архитектура», скачиваем готовые рипы уровни из сталкерской трилогии. После этого открываем все это в 3ds Max, предварительно переводим текстуры, которые были в данном паке, из 16-битного DDS в 32-битный DDS. Затем все это дело экспортируем в Unreal, ждем пока подгрузится и начинаем работать. Окей, переходим в сам Unreal, поехали. Итак, дорогие друзья, для начала я взял обычную карту мультиплеерную, которая называется АТП, которая, по-моему, появилась в Stalker King Chernobyl. Хотя, не буду загадывать, я с этим очень слабо знаком. Я немного улучшил ее, добавил постпроцесс, добавил немного тумана, слегка настроил свет и добавил вот объемные облака. Также я накинул на наш лендскейп, или же на пол, текстурку более-менее приятную земли, которая у нас находилась в Quixel Bridge, в Quixel Megascans в их ассетах. Вот. И больше, в принципе, ничего не ушел. Ну, добавим много деревьев. Первое, одну технологию работы со освещением, с освещением, да, простите, о которой мы поговорим немножечко позже. Как-то вот примерно вот так. Окей, для начала мы, наверное, с вами разберем такую технологию, которая называется Люман и которая, в свою очередь, отвечает за свет. Для этого как раз мною и были добавлены данные деревья, так как они у нас могут показать вот эту прекрасную игру со светом. Для начала, я думаю, стоит посмотреть, как же все это дело будет визуально, простите, отображаться. В полном отображении экрана, как видите, у меня вот пока что меньше 30 FPS, сцена нихуя не оптимизирована. И выдает то, что... Давайте посмотрим, к примеру, вот на наш элеватор, или как это называется, строение. Простите, я не помню. Очень красиво листочки отбрасывают тень, плюс вот эта физика ветра, все это динамично развивается. Ну, просто любо дорого смотреть, я бы сказал. Вспоминая оригинальный сталкер, конечно же. Друзья мои, давайте зайдем в постпроцесс и просто поиграемся немного со светом. Сейчас, простите, я отключу вот выделение. Прекрасно, прекрасно, дорогие друзья. В постпроцесс есть вот такая вот вкладочка, которая называется Global Illumination. На данный момент она у нас включена, и у нас выставлена вот данная новая технология Lumen. Что такое Lumen, мы разберем немножечко позже, после того, как мы увидим всю эту визуальную часть, все это, когда после этого мы перейдем к технической составляющей. Давайте попытаемся выключить ее. Ну что же, FPS, конечно же, подрос, но, блядь, согласитесь, стало как-то немного похуже. Люмана нету, люманы есть. Заметьте, вот эту есть... Люмана нету, люманы есть. Заметьте, вот эту естественность, эти мягкие тени. Вот эту разницу в цветовой передаче, насколько лучше она отображается. Есть также другие у нас методы освещения, screen space. Не знаю, тоже неплохо как бы. Да я бы даже сказал, что по FPS это получше будет. Но в целом с Люмана, мне кажется, не сравнится. Люман... Ну, чтобы так сыграть на скрипке, я бы... 